Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with a poetry review. Dalton, what poem are we reviewing right now? We're going to touch on a poet that we have not mentioned before on this channel. Yeah. This is Lord Byron, She Walks in Beauty. Yeah. Yeah. I just messed up your sound. I'm okay with that. You do that a lot. It's editing as hell. So what we'll do is we will start with two readings. Okay. Oh, you want me to take it first? Yes. So I can screw it up first. She walks in beauty, like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright, neat in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to the tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. Stop touching my foot. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely swept express how pure, how dear, their dwelling place. And so on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smile that wins, the tints that glow, but tell of day and goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. Boom. How do you make everything sound so boring? It's, <clears throat> it's a skill, really. It's a skill. I mean, it's, it is. It's you should talent. hear me read the entertaining stuff. I will. I, I always trip up on this poem. Yes. Always. That's going to be so. one of my points here in okay. a minute. So it, it's a weird read. Yeah. She walks in beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens over her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express, how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And so that cheek, and on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, sh the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell the days of goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. Indeed. Yeah, good things and bad things? Because there's always good, there's always bad. Uh, you want to go first? Or sure, I'll go first. Uh, this is... A great example of punctuation in poetry. Uh, you do know where the pause is supposed to be, although it's very weird and unnatural. We'll get there. But the punctuations are very well used, in my opinion. Uh, the first four lines are beautiful for perspective, visual depth, and vastness. Okay. Uh, if you're looking at the, poet the poem as a film, it's wonderful. Uh, your visual cues there. Uh, and also, this is very approachable for a beginner reader. It may be a clunky read, but it is an approachable read. Good things? Uh, if you're looking to commit a poem to memory, this one would be a fairly good Absolutely. candidate to do so with. Uh, it's very quotable line by line, and there's no real negative to the poem, right? There's no real weakness here. Okay. Which is, is a strength. It is a strength. Three bad things. Uh, the syntax of this poem can be a nightmare. It's, when you read it out loud, it's a nightmare every time, although it is very simple. Uh, this may be more whiny and more pining uh, than Emily Dickinson when you look at it. You shut your mouth. It's true. Uh, and this is absolutely the embarrassing love poem that you wrote in middle school. That's what it is. <laughs> If you wrote this in middle school, Dalton, I, I don't know why you're sitting next to me, but... Uh, I am Lord Byron. <laughs> <laughs> three, three bad things. One, this feels like a church hymn. Does okay. it not? Uh, two, the title is way better than the poem. Yes. Three, the poet is way better than the poem. Yes. So I am... I am surprised that this is one of the ones that has lived in infamy a little bit. And that's the thing. We were just talking about this, about finding a printed copy. Most of my literary anthologies did not have this. Yet this is the one Lord Byron is always quoted for. Right. Which is just bizarre to me. Uh, speaking of that, oh, we'll keep that thought. We'll do best line. Best line. Which I know I wrote down. Please do yours first. Uh, one shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace. Okay. The best line, and I will get to this, is the title line. 
shall I compare, or, oh, did I say <laughs> shall I compare these to a summer's day? You did. Huh. Because it's the exact fucking opposite of Sonnet 18. She walks in beauty like the night. The okay. balls on this man. Okay. The balls. Okay. We're going to argue that later. But okay. No, that, that's the best line because it's the stolen line. Okay. Uh, anyway, where do you want to start with this one? Uh, well, first off, you, you mentioned the printed copies. Mine is in a $1.50 Dover Thrift Edition, Great Poems, edited by Paul Negri. And in his introduction, or note, it is titled, I want to read this little quippet. Ben Johnson once said, even one verse alone sometimes makes a perfect poem. The truth of Johnson's assertion is simply evidenced in this collection of short poems. Here are works spanning 500 years of English and American literature from Shakespeare to Robert Frost, richly diverse in sensibility, style, and theme, but all with one salient feature in common, brevity. Uh, I think that that is worth reading for several reasons. One, you're mentioning Ben Jonson, Shakespeare, and Robert Frost, and you're saying that this poem is among them, which is, okay, if, if, you, wanna, if you wanna put that there, I'll let you. Um, but I think it's important to note the, the quote he chose from Ben Jonson. Even one verse alone is sometimes, even one verse alone sometimes makes a perfect poem. That's worth noting because this poem is three stanzas. Yes. Right? Um, so I think that, like you say, the line is better, 16, uh, is better than the poem. I do agree. Um, but now, that comes into play a lot with this poem because there's no real weakness here. Like I say, every one of these lines is fairly quotable. If you had a reason to quote any oh, one of these if lines. if you just pick up it. Uh, pick any of them. How pure, how dear, their dwelling place. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, um, it's very quotable. If you threw that in there somewhere, people would know you got it from great literature. The smile's the wind, the tints that glow. Yes. Um, here's the thing that gets me. Whenever I think about this poem and how quotable it is, it strikes me in a fashion which is more snarky than anything. For example, um, say, say you had just blown up. Okay. You just... Spontaneous were, combustion. No, no, you were a prick and walked out. Oh, okay. And someone says, and on that cheek and over that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent. Mm. Right? That's being snarky. It is a little bit. It's, uh, it strikes me more in a snarky fashion that this is quotable. Or if there's, if there's uh, you drive down Main Street and there's that hooker in the Tweety Bird shirt and you look at your passenger and say, she walks in beauty like the night. Right? This is true. Uh, I did, I, actually that was a point I wanted to bring up is, uh, this is very Streetwalker-esque. <laughs> if you think about it, yeah, it is. Uh, brazen terms like hookers. We're going to call them street walkers on this <laughs> channel. Them floozies. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing that really gets me about this poem, it's something I brought up in the quick review of William Carlos Williams' Red Wheelbarrow, is poetry as an art form is a bit of a dying art. Uh, poetry is not as prominent as it once was. Right. Look at film. Film is all visual perspective. Poetry is notorious for visual perspective if you break it down. Yeah. Did you lose your microphone again? Yes. Uh, I assume no one's heard anything but static for the last, like, ten minutes, and that's all they care about now. Uh, if you look at the first stanza of this poem, if I may. I suppose. Uh, she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in the aspect and her eyes. You go from infinite to minute. Uh, it's the visual zoom in and out from, again, the red wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. Zoom in, glaze with rainwater. Zoom out beside the white chickens. It is the necessary visual cues of this poem that make it relatable, that make it understandable, puts you into the poem. Uh, inherent of what makes this poem enjoyable today is our necessary cling to visual cues. Because of that, you get a visual aspect to a poem at which you have no attachment to at that time. Okay. Words are completely evading me today, so <laughs> if I'm just throwing out random words or making them up, please let me know. Well, I don't know that being contemporary is what what forces us to have something to look at in a poem. 
I'm not saying it, it, it's necessary to be appreciated or enjoyed, but I think it can be appreciated and enjoyed through a contemporary eye more so than it could have been when it was first penned. Do you really? Because we have so many more... Here's the thing. We live in a visual age. Absolutely sure. so. But we live in a visual age that is... Uh, that is such, I'm looking for a different poem in here just to make my example, but I can't find it. <laughs> but we live in a visual age because you can get on the internet and uh, look up a damn picture of anything you want, right? But before this, um, for example, Robert Burns, A Red, Red Rose. My, oh, my love's like a red rose, a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Now, Robert Burns lived 1759 through 1796. That love's red, red rose would have been a much bigger deal then than it is now because if he just says rose, I can Google rose and see what a rose looks correct. like. Correct. Back then, they would not have had Google, right? This is correct. Google only goes back at least 100 years. What the so, hell's a rose? So um, part of that I, that has been inherent in poetry for so long is because it's necessary to make your point. You don't just give the word, you have to give the description. Visual descriptions are how poetry paints. Yes. Again, going back to Carlos, uh, William, William Carlos Williams, Williams, Red Wheelbarrow, that poem is a great poem because of the visual elements of it. And the visual elements of, uh, the best way to describe it is film-esque. Zoom in, zoom out. Yeah. Uh, it, it just adds so much more if you look at it from a contemporary eye from if you were maybe breaking down a film as compared to breaking down a poem. I, uh, I, think, I think what you're confusing there is the criticism of the poem. Maybe what I'm getting at, it is much more approachable when spoken in that light. Because we have the nomenclature with which to address these things. Possibly which, so. You know, 300 years ago... Uh, you don't. You can't zoom in and zoom out because you don't know what. What, what do you what mean? What the hell is zoom? zoom? In? Yeah. Yes. You so, crazy bastard. I, I think that that's part of, again, that that having the nomenclature to speak about something like we Correct. talked about in the, the uh, the Fault in Our Stars review. Now, since we can look at it from contemporary eyes, you tell me I'm fucking wrong. This is the polar opposite and it's stolen directly from Sonnet 18. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. Okay. Okay. Defend yourself. Give me first line. She walks in beauty like the night. Okay. Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Okay. This is Lord Byron stealing the fucking first line of Sonnet 18 and saying, just flip it. Let's go the opposite approach. Same thing. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I think you... Okay, so do you have any other examples from the poem? Uh, not really prepared because oh, that is well. a glaring example, you rat bastard. <laughs> oh, well. I'm just saying, you take one of the greatest sonnets is, of all time. That is a glaring single point. I am obviously right. Uh, I'm just saying, you take the greatest poem of all time. Okay. Sonnet 18. Okay. At this point in time, that would have been a big deal. Yeah. Sonnet 18. And obviously, Lord Byron had read Sonnet 18. Okay. I'm going to say, as I'm going to take credit on factual, he read it. He knows Sonnet 18. This is the polar opposite of Sonnet 18. This is saying the same things, but using night instead of day. Comparing beauty to time. She's as hot as the afternoon sun, Adrian. Okay, well... It's interesting you should say that because your po this poem is on page 16. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day is on page 1. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. All right, cut there. Okay. Now read the first stanza of She Walks in Beauty. And you tell me they're not just the same fucking poem. Okay, um... She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all this best of dark and bright meet in her aspect of her eyes, thus mellowed by that tender light which heaven to, to gaudy day denies. Um, I don't see it. I don't see it. It is the same thing. How is it the it same thing? It is the same poem with the time flipped. The time flipped. That's all it is. How do you know the time flipped? It's day and night. Day and night. You've got no seasons. It is the same poem. You've got no seasons. In when you say summer, you immediately think a summer's day. So do we have winter and she walks in beauty? Possibly so. 
Possibly so. But if you take day and night, that is the same poem. Well, Dalton, you write this paper and I'll give you a C at best. You give me a C at best and I will take ownership of my A. (laughs) Because I will slip some feminist theory in there and I will get my A. That's that's how how you got through college. This is how I write papers. Uh, um, uh, Shoot something at me. I'm flustered now. The one thing that stuck out to me really from the nomenclature involved in this poem is the line... So soft, so calm, yet eloquent. Okay. How do soft and calm dispel the idea of eloquent? Such that they would need a yet. Oh, that is a good point. I think soft and calm go hand in hand with eloquence, especially if you're given it this time. Well, eloquent just means that you're able to get your point across. Okay. So soft and calm would neither be uh, here would neither be supported nor denied by a word like eloquent. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that's important to address when you're, when you're speaking about poetry is that the definitions of words are very important. Okay. That's why, like, the Dada movement was so big, because it said, no, they're not, you know? So to dispel that they are important at all is to make an important point. But you cannot be in the middle with things, and that seems like a very loose use of the word eloquent. Okay. Because if you are soft and calm, you can be eloquently so. If you are loud and boisterous, you can be, be eloquently well, so. Right? Okay. It just eloquent just means you're getting your point across, right? All right. You're getting your point across in a simple manner. So do you think that was a poor choice of words by the poet? Yes. Okay. I I I would argue that soft and calm do not mean eloquent. That mean the opposite of eloquent. So it's one of those those times where I think a lot with this poem. That it was written, like I said, it sounds like a church hymn. And it, it was does, written it to does. sound good. It, it wasn't written necessarily... And that is a good uh, point, but a lot of older poetry uh, sticks to a very rigid rhyme scheme. So a lot of it can fall under church hymn Well, but written to a rigid rhyme scheme does not discredit the fact that there could be depth in there yes. and that there could be... But this word works because it sounds good right. is what Byron went for. How do you feel about Raven's Tress? I'm for it. One shade, the more <laughs> one ray, the less, had half implied the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, uh, where thoughts serenely swept express how pure, how dear the dwelling place. This is visual, visual cues once again. This yeah. is, huh? Yeah. This is, again, a contrast between light and dark. But what is the place of saying Raven's tw- Tress besides just sounding good? You tell me. Uh, Raven. Symbology? Symbolism? They're very intelligent and they bring death. Brings death, yes. Stereotypical going forward. Uh, Raven, also a point for ancestral memory. Uh, Raven being considered, you know, the the wise raven and whatnot. And I can't remember if it is European or Native American because I'm just going to narrow it down to the two it possibly could be. uh, Where the raven represented ancestral memory. As saying Raven's Tress with the hair, not only does that give you light and dark contrasting, not only does it sound nice, but it's saying that the beauty that he's feeling towards her is more than just a whim. It's primal. It's a physical attraction that has always existed. It's that ancestral recall. This has been in his blood since uh, his ancestors, since his birth. Absolutely necessary to the poem. Makes it all the more pining, all the more necessary. Okay. Okay. I get one. Yeah. I'm going right. to start carrying a scorecard so I can just like hold it up because I got one and Adrian accepted it. He let me have it. So explain to me the line, thus mellowed to that tender light. That against the contrast. Because if we're going to throw the darkness of her hair, the raven's dress, the black hair, then we have to have that contrasting light. And then explain to me. This is visual elements. All which, over. Heaven this whole to God is visual. which heaven to gaudy day denies. I don't know. I didn't go that far. <laughs> God damn it. Give me my point. I'm taking my B now. Okay. Give me my B. I'll give you a C plus. I hate you so much sometimes. Uh, anything else you really want to talk about at this poem? You know, that's that's about all I've got on it. Okay. Um, this was not one, try as I might, that I was able to really 
get anything out of besides what it says. It's very cut and dry. There's not a lot there. I mean, you can dig. I would, I would be very dig. open to an interpretation that said something else. Okay. I was just not able to get there. Except any interpretation that says something else, you say, no, it's no. No. Only no. if it comes Defend from yourself, you. you're wrong. Only if it comes from you. I'm going to get that. What would you rate this poem? You know, I would give this... It... I am I am confounded a little bit by this poem's place in literature. Okay. Um, that said, I would give this 80 nameless graces out of 100. I wrote down 82 floozies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I'm so glad you picked up on the streetwalker ask of this. Uh, what would you suggest? Uh, the Phoenix and the Turtle by Shakespeare. Sonnet 18 by Shakespeare. Might as well read the original rather which, than the copy. Which we've got a review for, by the way. Oh, wouldn't it be convenient <laughs> if it just popped up above us? I'm not going to remember that in editing. <laughs> They're going to have to search. I'm sorry. I suck at this. Uh, but if you do like this kind of thing, we do poetry reviews quite a bit now. Yes. Poetry's great. We need more poetry on BookTube. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Give this video a like so we can get more poetry on BookTube. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at Strip Cover and on Facebook at Strip Cover cover lit.